So we have a few things we need to do. We need to find the professor. She'll have maybe our best hope of learning more about the Apocrita and learning what Aegon knew before he went off and did his thing. And Shock sort of pauses and doesn't say a thing that was on his mind and then says, she's just our best bet for getting more information about the heroes of Navarine and the Apocrita and what we can do next to stop them. In addition to that, we have to stop the Jagged Dream because they're going to drain energy from a whole lot of people so they can do something really powerful with Argent. We don't know what they're going to do with their time powers, but they're going to do something bad, and a lot of people will die just from them activating it. We know that at least two of their leaders are on board, and probably a third one, and we have no idea who they are. Uh, Vera Lanny, she's the leader of the gear part of the Jagged Dream. She controls machines. Patience is there. Patience, yes, that thing that Shock probably knew. Uh, there's the Blue Fairy, who is in charge of the Living Things section of the Jagged Dream. She controls organic life. Then there's the third section of the Jagged Dream, which controls stratic life from the Data Sphere, which is also all around us. So every one of the Jagged Dream members has a lot of things they can just mind control to fight us. We have to figure out what they're doing before they activate it and somehow also get the information to beat the Apocrita. It's fine. Everything's fine. And as you say, everything is fine. You just see the large organic mechanical tentacles of a pair of Zev pounding past you and bounding down the halls of the prodigious. So you are on board the prodigious proper. This is the Semester at Sky program with the University of Key. You are currently in the main courtyard of the prodigious. It's this very expanse. Uh, it almost looks like the inside of an arboretum or a jungle. Um, if every plant were selectively, very carefully put in the right place, and they were all fake plastic plants because actual plants are just way too unpredictable. Um, in the center, you can see seven spheres, a giant statue of seven spheres in the center of the garden, and that is uh, a statue of the Council of Spheres, the oligarchy that is not only the rulers of Key, but also the school board of the University of Key. And yes, as Shock said, you have a lot on your mind. On a large scale, you have to figure out what's going on with the Apocrita. Mauve and Mako are currently being chased by it, buying you time to get any information you can from their last teammate, the Professor, and you know nothing about her other than she is working on this ship. You also have to contend with the Jagged Dream, a cult that is planning on using a device called Argent to pull something, something terrible out of time that will cause a global war across the globe. It's going to cause a global <laughs> war. Nice. They are planning to unleash it in four days. So you are in the afternoon of day one, and then on prom is going to be when our climax happens. Prom de plume. What you know about the Jagged Dream is you know that the leaders Vera Leeni and the Blue Fairy are on board. Vera is the head of the patient cell. She can exert limited control over mechanical life, machines, androids, etc. Uh, the Blue Fairy can exert limited co control over organic life, so that's things like the bugs that she has as wings she can fly on. And then you have the mysterious Ezra, who can control life from the data sphere itself, called stratic life. Which, since you're on a ship that automates everything, literally everything from, like, the f primary functions to the, like, timers in the kitchens, uses the data sphere for that, is just fucking everywhere. So, you gotta find the professor, you gotta figure out who Ezra is hiding undercover as, and you gotta find Argent, and you got four days to do it. Great. So what are those days going to be like? Because so far, all of our arcs have taken place over the course of one day. And since our last arc was 15 episodes long and we have four days, we cannot have a 60 episode arc. <laughs> I mean, you set this up for yourself, Kyle. <laughs> I did. So every day is going to be split up into a morning segment, which is anything before noon and an afternoon segment, which is anything afternoon. Uh, so, for example, today we only have the afternoon segment. During the morning, you're going to go to the class dictated by your school ID. There you'll be able to learn more about a topic based on, you know, your education. You can maybe focus on getting a skill. You can further bonds with an NPC and you can just do good old in-classroom investigating. In the afternoon, you'll be free to go wherever you want on the prodigious. There are a series of pre-existing rooms and then there are also a lot of question marks on the map. 
which are just places where you can be like, hey, is there a Starbucks on the first floor? Because I want there to be a Starbucks on uh, first deck. So you'll get you'll get to choose that. And for anyone listening, I will put that map in the show notes. Not only includes all the location, it includes all of the suspects for who Ezra might be so far. Each round, you'll get to do one thing. Every PC will. You can bring other PCs and NPCs with you. So like if Shock and Misha do a thing, Misha will still have a turn to do a thing. And then it's just kind of assumed that outside of that time, you'll meet up and for meals and share information and such. And then there are are certain events that if you don't take care of them yourselves, they will automatically happen just after one of the morning or afternoon turns. For example, yeah, like the like, thing in Robocatsis. <laughs> yeah, like you're gonna, you have to see the professor. <laughs> you just have to, or the story doesn't work. So, like, if you don't, fi- you can f- search for her, but you'll find her otherwise. Maybe not the most opportune time, but it'll happen. Uh, there are also opportunities. Or our uh, trademarked name, Hot Opportunities. Yeah. There are hot opportunities, which are going to be time sensitive events you can attend. Uh, for example, every afternoon session, there will be a prom specific event you can do in order to try to appeal to multiple individuals and maybe make your ascent to the prom oligarchy. So, for example, during this first afternoon session, there are two time sensitive opportunities you can take. As you look around you, you can see this poster. And it has words on it, but there's also just like a million stamps of like authorizations. And yes, we have the permit to do this. We can put this in the right space. And it is for toe drop or football for a needs. <laughs> Next to it, you can see a crudely made poster. It looks handmade in like crayon or marker for the Great Vespari Show, which is tonight in the band room. On your turns, you can do whatever, but you can also, if you want to, attend Toe Drop, which is football for Aeneans, or you can see what the Great Vespari, air quotes, and his assistant, the Blue Fairy, not air quotes, because that's a pretty accurate representation of what she is. Uh, you can see what they've been up to. All right, so... Let's have our first afternoon session. Afternoon! Day one! So Shock will see that that poster for the Great Vespari, and we get the the eye zoom blocks, <laughs> like, <laughs> like the bars would zoom in on his eyes, and he's just like... <whistles> Misha Jarvis, I think we should go to the show. We need to keep an eye on the Blue Fairy and also Vespari because I'm not sure we can trust him either. You know, out of character, I was thinking the same thing, so I'm glad that we are literally (laughs) (laughs) mind-connected. In response to what Shock said, uh, Michelle will say, Oh, I was thinking the same thing, actually, Shock. I do not trust Vespari or the Blue Fairy, and I think that it is on our best interest to keep a close eye on them and make sure that they are not doing anything out of order during their show. And Misha is going to try and make, like, air quotes, but instead of the air quotes, they are going to do the whole hand. I love them. <laughs> so pure. And I guess let's figure out, let's just figure out what Ellie and Hop are doing doing and then we'll do all the scenes so ellie what what is your plan of attack all right can i safely let the children the children children not the shock and misha children (laughs) are they gonna go off and do their own thing is yeah you'll see zoe everett jesse walking off and then cubo rolling behind them okay just checking i don't want to abandon my babies (laughs) the npcs will be fine probably (laughs) what um I kind of want to try to look for the professor or maybe just hide in the deepest, darkest corner and pretend I'm not on a boat in the sky. Okay. And then Hop, what will you be doing? Hopper, ever since Roletia, has just been really hankering for some alone time. But the spiders came right after they left and then the Mav and Mako thing happened and then they had the trip in the Ladybug 2 key in like really close quarters. So this hasn't gotten the chance to like disappear for a while. He just wants to find like an abandoned classroom or somewhere that is that is clearly not going to be used in the space of the next few hours. Okay. He was going to read, but <laughs> our books are in the are in the cloud now, so he can't. <laughs> In that case, let's let's get started. 
Well, the word got around, he put all others to shame, man. Found the Zev and figured out a way to make them today, man. Told the council they gave him unprecedented fame. Said the world's gonna know your name. What's your name, man? I'm the guy who found the Zev. It's me, I'm the guy who found the Zev. And one day I'll become the Amber Pope. But in a while, yes, in a while. So you're sitting in <laughs> to the show. I made a mistake. <laughs> Calival. The story of High Father Calival. This is a student performance occurring before the great Vespari is going on. Uh, you're sitting in here, this band room, and you're seeing all these students sing it very off key. The story of this guy is as they try to rap, but they mostly just say words in rhythm. You, uh, you, you hear the story of this guy, High Father Calival, who is the one who originally found the Zev in uh, Zev Garden and brought them to the Council of Spheres, and his ascendance as he uh, tamed these creatures and he brought them in and uh, and kind of made them the the face the defensive face of the city of key and like he just acts like he's the coolest and you're just like wow he's so cool and it's just a little weird uh, at one point actually you see this person with pressed silver hair and a sweater vest lean over to misha and they say i really like this show i really ca i really prefer they would have uh left in the deleted song that they had where they were discussing about just how horrifically they were treating the zev it's really a whole lot of nuance that's being missed here. Oh, um, salutations, sudden, uh, it, uh, just clarification, is it, a, is it a person or is it a, what is? They are a person and you can use he or they pronouns for them. I, either one works. Okay. Salutations, unidentified person to my right. It seems like you know quite a bit of this show. My nomenclature is Misha Jarvis. And I would be pleased to hear more about your thoughts on it. Of course. My name is Le Adrian, with the apostrophe. It is a pleasure to meet you, Misha Jarvis. Pleasure to meet you, Adrian, with the apostrophe. <laughs> I am just very uh, fascinated by the tales of villains and how heroically they can be treated. I think it's just a fascinating thing, don't you think? Oh, you you like stories about villains? I think they're much more uh, colorful, yes. Huh, that is very interesting. I do not see a lot of color in this specific performance, but I will keep that in mind. Well, they don't know how to show it, but, you know, maybe next year they'll let me be part of the show. <laughs> What a salty theater kid. And Le Adrian, with an apostrophe, uh, leans back in their chair. And uh, yeah, you keep watching the show. What do you What do you think of uh, of Calival? Out of character, I hate it. I hate you, <laughs> <laughs> and I regret ever showing you. <laughs> This is musical. <laughs> All right, so Ari has regrets. How about Misha and Shock? I mean, Misha, Misha is just curious to learn about this story. Like they, they like stories, and they are actually kind of intrigued by it. But they are gonna make a mental note because the fact that Adrian would have an apostrophe uh, <laughs> is interested about villains makes it a little bit suspicious in their mind. So, uh, Shock. Shock has his doubts about this high father Calival type. The guy who found the Zev, mm, uh, it seems like the Zev didn't really need to be found. Shock doesn't quite understand all of the nuance behind systems of oppression and domestication, but like it feels weird to him that these animals were turned into an army. And so the play continues and finally it ends and you you hear lots of applause and Le Adrian just stands up and just like gives a very like, you know, the like threatening villain clap where it's like very loud, but very slow. Where it's like. Which is going to imitate that. <laughs> and then uh, finally silence. And then you hear, There once was a world without magic, and then magic became part of the world, ingrained and functional and dull. Today, you will witness a magician who does not need magic to be magic. You shall witness I, the great Vespari, Mm. 
then suddenly, like, you just see a little, a little tiny smoke bomb, and you see the great Vespari in his cape pop onto the stage, not wearing his plague doctor mask. Instead, you just see his waxy, stretched face, and it's in this terrible grimace and smile. And he's like, it is I, the great Vespari, and today I shall show you wonders that you will not need to wonder from whence they came. And I will be bringing alongside me my wonderful assistant. I said my wonderful assistant. Oh, no. I said, one second, please. And he quickly walks backstage and starts uh, rummaging around. Uh, Misha Misha will reach. Oh, sorry, you go first. Uh, uh, Misha will reach to shock in their mental link capacity and say, I believe that this show seems to be starting it up worse than the last time we saw it. (laughs) (laughs) Is it even possible? I am a little bit surprised because I didn't think it would be able to happen. I agree, Misha Jarvis, but I also think we made a mistake in believing that the Blue Fairy would be constrained by a schedule. I think we should try to sneak back and see what we can find out. And Shock will, like, get out of his seat and start... What if he just far steps? I guess Misha can be late. <laughs> oh, no, no, he's not far stepping yet. Like, Shock, Shock isn't trying to, like, make a spectacle before the audience. This isn't, this isn't a no magic is cool thing. This is a we should go backstage and, like, try to find a blue No, I know, but you can make it less, less obvious that you're sneaking out of the performance. <laughs> it's in the muse. it's in the band room. Tom, you're just standing up in front of everybody and waddling sideways through the chairs. Well, like, I'm acting like... People will notice that you're leaving. Yeah, I'm acting like I'm leaving because the show is bad. It's, <laughs> this is a reasonable plan. Just loudly be like, I need to go to the bathroom. I think for added realism, Shock needs to do some sort of, ah, this show is... Come up with some sort of bullshit reason why the show is bad and you're leaving. I guess, I guess Misha can even reach and be like, I agree with you, but I think that leaving like that might be a little bit obvious, especially if there are other people that might be watching us. I think we should have a better excuse to, to leave this show. Well, Shock has been put on the spot <laughs> because I don't I feel like Far Step will be significantly more flashy. And my only other idea was like just calling out Vespari to, as a distraction. But he's also <laughs> off the stage now. So also, I imagine Shock is like he's like half up, like you're starting to get up. Your hands are on the back of your seat. And then Misha just says, I don't know if this is the best idea. And you're just like, do I awkwardly sit back down? Do I keep moving? <laughs> what do I do now? Shock freezes in that mid stand up. Oh, you can keep going if 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 this makes it more suspicious. I think I should have spoken earlier. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and his voice cracks through the mental link. And then Shock will just announce to the people standing nearby. Uh, this show is, as I have heard them say, among the youths of the beyond. Not especially good. And then we'll just walk out as if it was the most natural thing in the world. You uh, turn uh, to walk around. Who do you want to give your GM intrusion other point to? <laughs> Gonna give it to Misha Jarvis because we are committed to us getting through this. You turn around and you feel what feels like a dozen fingers pressing on your shoulder. Mm. Uh, and you see further away on the pathway, you see the blue fairy looking at you and one of her wings has just kind of set itself on your arm. Mm. No, no, don't go. And you just see uh, her lips, which have been sewn shut, just oh, God. do a warm smile as her eyebrows raise. And then she flutters off onto the stage and taps on the ground and Vespari comes out as you're just standing there like what the fuck just happened it's like oh my wonderful assistant so I didn't even have to be in the room to bring her here how impressive is that please clap (laughs) (laughs) that sounded desperate Shark will (laughs) sit down but will do a slow villain clap (laughs) Misha will imitate him. And you just gained one heart point with La Adrian, <laughs> both of you. Where where should we be recording heart points on our character sheet? Uh, if you want to. Or or like are you keeping track of it as well? Do you think I wanna you think I give a shit about this web of lies? 
<laughs> no, I'm just throwing them out like fucking cotton candy. All right, all right, all right. Guess only Shuck won the, the heart. No, you both. Oh. You both did the clap. Ladrian is very impressed by your villainous clap. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, as you clap, Vespari looks at you. All right, let us continue the show. And Vespari continues the show frozen by your icy cold gaze and it is not a good performance like this already wasn't the crowd for this kind of fake magic and also in key everybody has a role so somebody who's not a nano trying to do esoteries is not filling their role why is he on this ship is the question running through everybody's name mind why is he here And I certainly assure you, Vespari seems to be thinking the same thing as he stumbles through a terrible performance. Misha at this point will be like to shock. Well, I believe that we cannot be as subtle anymore, but I am a little bit pleased that he is not getting the respect that he gained in Ruletia because he does not deserve it. I like this crowd. Shock says back, I should be happier, but somehow I'm not. I think I'm just sad. I don't really understand why he does what he does. Seeing people angry at him doesn't necessarily make it better. Suppose I have a lot to learn still. We, we both do. All right, Ellie, you're sick as shit. You just <laughs> feel terrible. Ellie is full of (laughs) sheer horror at the situation that she's in. And as soon as Zoe is out of sight, she just kind of melts a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then uh, when, when, when you regain your bearings, where are you going in the prodigious? Did they give us any information about where the professor might be? Because there's no classes going on. Um, there is a teacher's lounge on the top floor. There are five main areas of the prodigious. Well, six. There's the gondola where we started. There's the courtyard. But in addition to the main floor, there are three decks. Now, most people would be like, oh, first year, second year, third year, right? That's how we're going to organize uh, our years. And the longer you've been at the school is the num- your number of years. So, like, if I've been here one year, you're a first year. If it's your second year, you're a second year. The prodigious recognizes that no, 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 seniors rule the school. So they don't, they don't rank their decks by year, they rank by superiority. So on the bottom you have the third deck, that's like the third class. These are oftentimes the freshmen and maybe some of the students who aren't liked or favored as much. Second years will be on the second deck. And then the seniors, or the most favorable students, and the teachers are on the first deck. And uh, third deck, it's like the Titanic. Third deck is on the bottom, then you have the main floor, then you have second deck, and then first deck is at the top. And that's where the teacher's lounge is, if you want to go there. Yeah, uh, I'd like to make my way up to the teacher's lounge on slightly shaky legs. (laughs) So you slowly make your way up the steps, and I need you to roll to see how well you make it up the, uh, there are, like, slanted walkways and elevators but I'm assuming you take the stairs. Elevators. <laughs> I'm going to take the stairs. I'm gonna I'm gonna try it. Oh. <laughs> Three. So I don't like the look on your face, Kyle. <laughs> take nine points of intellect damage. <laughs> oh my god. I'm sorry. What? Take nine points of intellect damage. Oh, by the way, armor doesn't protect against intellect damage. Nine points? Why do I take nine points of intellect damage? Because you're feeling real sick. Oh no. <gasps> All right. Also, I'm, uh... cool. Minus nine int out of the 12 that I have. Oh no. <laughs> Keep going. All right, so describe this terrible, horrific ascent up the stairs and how Ellie feels when she realizes halfway up that if she needs to get to dinner, she's going to have to go all the way down again. Ellie is feeling okay confidence-wise the first couple steps, but by the time she reaches, like, the fifth, that's when it starts to just... Where the stairs always curved... Were some of them uneven? As she goes up steps, it slowly gets worse and worse with her coordination. She stops at one point, does not throw up. That 
pride gets her up the rest of the steps next. And at one point when Ellie just is buckling over, you swear you can hear a coarse voice go, ah! and when you look up, you can see one of the uh, security cameras, if you look up, just looks away from you as soon as you look up towards it. Shut up, for fuel. And so you make your way up, you make your way to the teacher's lounge, and you see this top floor, it's very, it's like sci-fi, it's like chic, it's chrome, it's, uh, everything is, like, reflecting, and, like, it, you look up and you swear you can see the stars, even though it's just a cheap imitation, because, like, it, there's boat there. But ah, s- everything kind of spins a little more and she just like squints at the shiny. And you make your way to this door, I guess. It's it's just part of the wall, but there's a little sign that says teacher's lounge and there's a place for an ID badge. And then you realize, fuck, you need a teacher's ID to get in. I'm going to poke it a little bit. <laughs> with your with what? With my hand. Are you just going to poke at it with your hand? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. So I got, I got it. I got a ID, right? Yeah. I want to take it out and put it in on the scan, whatever. All right. You go and you move your ID, and very dramatically, it slowly goes towards the panel and it hits it, and we hear a sh- as the door goes up. But then we also hear some very loud bagpipe music as this just angry man with a massive beard barrels into you and keeps walking. So you don't know if it was your idea or him, but if you want, you can enter in through the door. I like to think that because he hit into me, I just kind of fall over (laughs) and lay face down halfway through the door for a second. And drag myself up and enter the teacher's lounge. <laughs> uh, and as you walk in, you uh, feel this uh, woman put her hand on your back. And she says, oh, are, are you all right? I'm on a boat. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, yes, you're on a boat. Is that code or something? No, everything just sucks when I'm on a boat. And I'm going to turn to look at her. You turn over and you see this woman with orange hair, freckles, and uh, acne. She's wearing a large, heavy trench coat. And she looks a lot like the professor in the image you had seen if she was maybe 20 years younger. Uh, any- anyway, uh, I'm Ellie. Oh, <laughs> hi, Ellie. Uh, my name is... You know, let's let's get you seated first. And she turns over. She's like, "Hey, Miss Farah, could you pull up a seat for her?" And you hear just the scraping <laughs> of a metal chair as Vera takes whatever her doom fist hand is and just like indents into it. And she just gently moves a folding chair over for you for you to sit down on, not letting go of the chair. Uh, and the like... woman says, "Miss Vera is is new too, so oh, uh, no. we're we're all kind of new to our situation right now." I'm gonna meet Vera's eyes. Bear is going to meet yours. And then she's going to remember the time you would ra- you rather stripped naked in front of everybody than just <laughs> fucking be polite. You can see her try to like control her anger so she just doesn't doom fist on you. <laughs> I would like to take my chair off my back and set it down next to the chair she pulled up and sit in it. <laughs> And Vera will just unclench the chair, which you can see has indents in it, and she just sets it back. And the orange-haired woman says, "Oh, that's no, that's a great idea. I didn't I didn't think about that. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great chair. You have a chair. She has a chair. That's Vera, and that's Ellie. And yep. I'm sorry, I'm not good at introducing people. I'm I'm. Well, maybe I'd- you could introduce yourself to me. Oh." Right, but I've already introduced myself to... Oh, right, I just introduced myself to her. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry. I'm Professor Myra Frank Manning the Fourth. A fun fact, I'm actually the first person in my family named Myra. My dad just didn't understand how name works. I don't know why I always introduce that like it's a fun fact. Anyways, I, I, I teach Dungeon Delving here. Uh, and then uh, Vera teaches... What, what was it that you taught again? Yeah. Uh, Vera? What do you teach, Vera? Physical education. What do you teach, ma'am? Well, that's a great get to know you question. Hey, I'm feeling really, um, 
I'm on a boat. Can someone get me water, please? And Myra looks at you and she's like, oh, yes, I guess I can get, yeah, I can get you water. And she scurries off to get some. I'm going to lean in closer to Vera, but I'm not going to stand up because I don't know if I could stay standing well enough. I'm watching you, Vera. I know why you're here. And uh, she she leans into you. Miss Batch, it's flattering to know that, that you're so concerned with watching me, but you might want to catch your legs before you do. And I need you to roll uh, speed defense. Oh, no. Oh, Jesus Christ. Is this just the part of the chapter where the villains dunk on us to remind us that they're threatening? Henley pisses off every villain at the beginning of the chapter. I rolled a 19! She goes to move the chair, and it just doesn't budge. I want to plant my foot next to, if she was trying to move the chair, where her foot is. Miss... Leany, I seem to remember our last encounter ending with a clear winner. And I seem to remember that winner being me. You got hit in the face with a chair. She's gonna stare at you for a second and stand up. And she's gonna set her hand on the other folding chair. Miss Badge, you know the purpose of our organization. Violence and struggle enacts change and enacts growth. And if all you have to throw at me this time is more chairs, I'm afraid to let you know that while my capacity for growth is infinite, and she just crushes the folding chair in her hand, your chairs are not. Hello, and welcome to the announcement break for Quest Friends Episode 39, Crime and Courtship Part 4. I am Kyle, your GM, and our intro and outro song are Friends and Hitoshio, both by Miracle of Sound. So today, our announcement break is going to be comprised entirely of Patreon shoutouts. Uh, if you subscribe to our Patreon on patreon.com slash questfriends, if you subscribe at the $5 level or above, you get, uh, among a bunch of other cool things, such as monthly short stories, gameplay clips, and HD wallpapers, you get a one-time shoutout from a non-player character of your choice. So we have two Patreon shoutouts for me to do today. And both of them are going to kill my voice. So, uh, the first NPC shout-out comes from Jerry, the Pie Pod Teenager. And mine, my, my one is for Kent, or at Sir underscore Kent underscore M at, uh, at, on, on, on Twitter. Uh, Sir... This person won't leave uh, and keep saying something about a party on or, or something like that. Uh, at least he paid full price for his pie pod, though. All right, is that is that is that the line? Did I do it good? He's still here. He's still listening. Oh, uh, I'm just gonna go in back, okay? All right, so that was our first shout out. Thank you so much, Kent for uh, subscribing, and thank you for picking Jerry, the Pie Pod Teen, whose voice I only did once, and so I have no idea if it's accurate. Even though he rarely appears, and he doesn't want to be there, I still love him. And Jerry, the Pie Pod Teen, will certainly come back. He's not going to come back. He might come back. I haven't decided yet. All right, our second NPC shout-out comes for, for me! It comes from Jesse! It's Jesse. I'm the one who does it. So this one comes. <coughs> <coughs> All right. So this one, this one goes for Lee Cope. And, and Lee said, 
Uh, Lee said it would mean a lot to me, not to them, not to me, not to Jesse. It would mean a lot to Lee if I just wished them good luck. Well, good luck, Lee. Oh, so it looks like Lee has things like conventions and job applications and could use a little more luck. Well, I don't mean to disagree, but I don't think you need any luck at all. Because you're great, and I think you're going to do a fantastic job. But good luck all the same. You've got my support and Everett's support. Ugh. He, he, he doesn't want to say it out loud, but he wishes you good luck too. All right, thanks so much, Lee. And again, thanks so much, Kent, for subscribing at a $5 level or above on Patreon. Again, that's patreon.com slash questfriends. That's all I've got for you today. These past few episodes have been a bit late because my sister had the audacity to get married. But now that that's over with, we'll hopefully be getting on a pretty regular schedule. So expect our next episode, Crime and Courtship Part 5, sometime the week of Monday, June 24th. I will see you then. Hop. Yeah. You you want to go into a mope corner? I do. Where is your mope corner? <laughs> um, I'm thinking I want somewhere that is empty. First of all, that is the number one requirement. Um, so actually, I'm thinking of looking at the stargazing balcony because it's like mid afternoon, right? So no one's gonna be up there during the day. Okay. You're kind of at the top. You can look down and you can see the many fake plants and the big statue of the seven spheres beneath you, since the balcony is at the top of the courtyard arboretum of fake plants i'm so mad <laughs> and um yeah you go out and you just take a look at the sky and uh kind of what's hop what is hop thinking about how's hop feeling um hop would just kind of like beat against the wall and look up at the sky and then slowly slide down until he's on the floor leaning against the wall and he was going to read his jameson hopper book maybe to see if anything could be saved from that but it is currently in the cloud so he only has the lorraine letter <laughs> no um, so he pulls that sucker out i guess no don't do it <laughs> and don't like, do it hopper <laughs> Oh, Making no. in-character choices is the bane of my existence, but he <laughs> pulls out the letter. And he's it's not even that he's reading it, really. He's just staring at it and remembering it. And he's just thinking about how, like, he really fudged this one up. The best thing that ever happened to him, <sighs> he lost it. And it was explicitly his fault because he never deserved her in the first place. So where does that leave him? Just as Simon and Simon. I want you to roll a perception check. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a 16. <gasps> whoop, whoop. Yay. Hop, you look at the stars and for a second, you can feel what feels like mist around you, like some warm and you can like hear this flowing air. Uh, and if you look out at the stars, you can see what looks for just a split second like the sun and then when you do a double take it's gone hopper scotch is alone night day one shock and misha are not alone though uh you have just left your performance adrian is very uh, impressed with you and you can hear Virgule say right, i'm for dinner and so it, everyone's making their way to dinner where you'll see your companions again, but you have the opportunity to do one thing before them. So what are you going to do? 
Okay, since we're leaving, Misha will say, uh, l- later in with a, what was it? Later in with an apostrophe, I have found your comments on plays and villains deeply interesting, and I think that we should talk more in the future. I would like to learn more in your company, if you're fine with this. Yes, that sounds very interesting. You and your company are quite colorful and I just don't know. There's just something about you that feels like we're just operating on the same level. Oh, yeah. And suddenly Misha can, uh, and suddenly we as a cosmic audience remembers that Misha in Rouletia got the ability to automatically impress members of the upper class. (laughs) Members of the 1% who are not familiar with them. Okay, I guess I'm 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 still wearing... No, you aren't wearing the mask. You just automatically exude that. You just got that natural ability. Oh, I didn't know I had that internalized. That's legit. How's Shock feeling about that? (laughs) Oh, also, you have two hearts with uh, La Adrian now, but just Misha. <laughs> uh, since Misha asked La Adrian to go out sometime. Shock isn't the jealous type. A s- Shock is fine with this. Like, um, I do want Misha to have a mental link with Shock after that. And basically you say, as much as I do enjoy your company, and I truly do, I am not being deceitful. I do think that we will be able to learn more sometimes by exploring by ourselves. But luckily, we have this link and we can still keep communicated on what we find. I look forward to exploring this place separately, but also together with you. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that would be more most delightful. And then Misha's going to be, oh, uh, I suppose related to being together, even if we are separated, um... I had the chance at the store to buy something that I think you might enjoy, so I would like to give this gift to you. And then Misha would give the skipping stone to Shock, which is just a stone that skips even if it's not in like a, a water thing. And they're going to say, I got this because I, I remember you talking about how you liked looking at the ocean back at your place and I have yet to experience this but I believe it is a a human custom to throw stones sometimes and see them skip in the water and well I know there's no water here but maybe if you throw it sometimes and watch them skip it can remind you of home (laughs) oh fucking heart Heart up. Heart up. <laughs> you swooned this wizard boy. Like, when you when you first bought that, I was like, yeah, that'd be a good gift for Shock. Shock would enjoy the novelty of this thing. But then it's like, oh, I remembered that story you told about looking out over the ocean. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> I done good. But I guess Misha, uh, one thing I want to include is that Misha, when they're heading to dinner, will be like, I do not really need to eat, but I enjoy just recounting stories with my friends. So I will go to this dinner and watch you eat. And watch you eat? (laughs) I I had a feeling that was coming. (laughs) This cafeteria is a scramble. Where every other place is very finely put and everyone is supposed to be in their proper place. The second food gets on the table, the societal structure breaks down and everyone just kind of runs to get the best food they can. And somehow, like, you, people are, like, elbowing each other and, like, shifting in and, like, you see the, like, Zev are just shrugging their shoulders like, eh, well, this is how it works. So you, you basically have to get through a brawl to get to your food. But you're able to find and sit down at a table next to each other. Uh, and then all four of you are able to reconvene and, and sit down at a table together. And normally, we'll just automatically go through this thing. We'll assume, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, you all go and get it together and you kind of, like, reconvene and talk about your stuff but i just figured you know since this is going to be the first time in this grimy cafeteria just what's it like what are you eating nothing like how how do you kind of talk about your adventures is this how you're getting around not knowing what food the cafeteria was gonna have (laughs) do you want it to just serve chicken wings each night 
Check and wings. Because it can just be <laughs> check and wings. I mean, it can be a pretty tacky shape. Like, there are some cafeterias <laughs> that just have, like, three things all the time. All right. It has these three things, which I better edit this episode before we have the next thing. Uh, for dinner, it has check and wings. It has puts on the Ritz. And then it has salat. Slot. Slot. Make your own salat. What about do they serve smashed potatoes? They do serve smashed potatoes. Topatoes, yes. damn it. I'm wrong, Kyle. Sm- they, they do serve smashed... What the fuck were they? Smash, smash topedos. They do serve smashed topedos. Yes. But you're gonna have to rush to get to it. I, I will. Shock just far steps on top of the <laughs> smashed topedo. <laughs> Actually, yeah, yeah. I'll just far step to the, the front of the the line for that. Okay. Shock is far stepped, and he has a smashed topedo topedos. Uh, what is everyone else having? Uh, Hopper doesn't feel like putting forth the effort to like get. He's just taking whatever he can find. He does not feel like going through the effort. All right, so Hop has a bucket of check and wings. Yeah, he just grabbed whatever. And Ellie, what are you having? Um, I started getting some of everything, but everything was still just like a little warpy. So I managed to get to the table with just like this jumble. All the food is jumbled together. Then I just slide it over to Hopper and stick my face on the table and groan. Oh. <laughs> Hopper will like, he's he's still, he's clearly, <laughs> he's being kind of quiet and out of it. But at that, at Ellie's just sliding this momentous, I hit my mic, at Ellie just sliding this momentous pile of food over him. He's going to actually look at her. And I'm assuming because your head is on the table, it's pretty obvious you don't feel well. <laughs> so he's going to go, Ellie, are you okay? I'm on a boat. Is that a problem? I didn't know that was going to be a problem. It's not a problem if anyone asks. Only when I complain about it. Okay. Do you not want me to ask? Opening my mouth might make the vomit come out. Okay. Look, I just, I don't like boats and I don't like flying and my feet belong on the ground and the ground alone. Ellie, I didn't know you had a thing about airships. I'm 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 sorry. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it, but I'm sure there's like a nurse's office. Don't has... you don't need to apologize. I'm not the one who just got dumped. <gasps> Hopper. <laughs> Look, man. The first thought that occurs to Hopper is is it that obvious? <laughs> <laughs> so he just kind of like sits there stunned for a second, trying to think of how to backpedal out of this. But then if Ellie will speak, he he takes a couple seconds to respond. So if Ellie wants to add anything. Her like hands and arms are on either side of her hat on the table as well. And so she'll just kind of like pat around with one of her hands, not picking her head up to see if she can find your hand or your shoulder or something. She's just kind of patting around. Hopper will extend his hand to where she's patting so that she can find it. Look, I've dumped a lot of people (laughs) and a lot of people have dumped me. (laughs) It happens, Hopper, and it sucks. But you know what? At least you're not constantly about to puke. At least you... you are... are... at least you seem to be okay on boats, and... and... and you're better off without her anyway. That's where I was going with this and then I started getting sick again but you're better off without her you're a good kid let out the dump sadness it's okay because Ellie can't see Hopper's face because she's under her hat on the table Hopper will allow himself to do a really sad smile at you're better off without her the kind of sad smile you do when you're like you're trying (laughs) but no (laughs) <laughs> um, so he does kind of a sad smile and then um just sort of looks at his food and then he says i wasn't dumped because we were never a thing but thank you 
And so you eat in silence for a while. Eventually, I'd imagine you start talking a little bit about what you saw, what's going on with clues, figuring out Ezra, all that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, you have dinner and you hear Virgule. Okay, it's time for sleep. Sleep time. Go to bed. And everybody walks out and you start making your way down the hallways. And at one point you turn around the corner and it's this quiet, empty corridor. And you're tired. You've seen a lot. You know, you have a lot to think about. Ellie has a lot to try to keep down. And suddenly out of the shadows, you hear a voice say, So I heard that you also thought there was going to be a crime in this space. What? You turn over and out of the shadows, you see the man with black hair and the blonde no, mustache. No, 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 Kyle, no, don't do this. No. And he walks out to you and he says, Oftentimes in confined spaces like this, they are prone breeding grounds for crime. Fucking <laughs> disrespect. No. And I thought I was originally alone in the search for crime, but I heard that you are also looking for some devious activities. And he rips off the blonde mustache. <laughs> he says, I apologize if that is alarming to you to see my disguise go away, but I just thought it was important that we start off on an honest foot. Okay. My name is Inspector Cecilos, although that is not my real name. No, that is a fake name that I use while on a ship. It is my ship name i thought you were starting off with being honest well i can't completely give my full name away i have to be honest about the fact that i have to be using a fake name just for protection purposes what are your ship names i'm simon i am shock my nomenclature is misha i'm sick as shit and i want to go to bed <laughs> that's ellie well it is a pleasure to meet you simon shock Misha and Ellie. I... Holy fuck, I just got the name. Oh, <laughs> God, I am not... <laughs> Oh, okay, it's fine. Anyways, I do not want to keep, I do not want to prevent you from getting the sleep. I personally am not uh, a fan of sleep. I just have too much I have to think about at any point in time. But I wanted to let you know that I am also on the case. And while I have a perfect record with solving these crimes, if you have any information, send it my way and I will. And he just slinks into the shadows and you just see these two big eyes. I will keep in touch. Is he a suspect? Inspector Cecilos is a suspect, yes. He's at the top of my suspect list. <laughs> yeah, fine. Okay, and I think I think that really covers that kind of covers everything for the first uh for the first night before you get to bed, and I think it, it hits everything for this episode. But as everyone kind of goes off their separate ways, Ellie to first deck hop to third deck. Yeah, that feels right. And everyone else to second deck. Uh, everyone is going off, and I think Hop just kind of stands in place for a second. Like, we just see him kind of standing there, not not knowing where his room is, but not knowing where he needs to go. And then we hear a second pair of footsteps, and we see Misha Jarvis approach. Um, so Misha had noticed throughout the day and throughout the past time since we left Ruledia that, I mean, everybody has been a little bit shaken by what happened, but they have specifically seen Hop really off, which is weird that they noticed that because they usually don't pick up on these cues, but they just kind of have been w wanting to help somehow to lift Hopper's spirits off. Uh, even though they kind of having known how to. And as they kind of glanced at him during this dinner with Ellie, they kind of decided this might be a good time to give him something they, they have planned to. And so they're going to approach Hop and say, uh, Simon Scotch, would you have a moment? Yeah, what's up? Um, well, I have noticed that, you know, you have been different since we left. And... I know we all have, I know we all have had hard times, but I, I think that you left part of you back there. And even though I know that this won't really replace it, and I know that this won't signify that things will get better right away, I, I want you to know that whatever was left in our past should not be the past. So I want to give you this and... I truly hope that it will help, and I want you to know that I don't think that whatever you left there is truly you. I think there is more to you than what you left there. 
and they are going to give a, a gift that's wrapped like really like Misha just like wrapped it really hazardously. Oh my god! Um, but if you were to guess the shape, it you you could see that it kind of looks if you have an active imagination like a snake in a, eating an elephant kind of shape. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Misha is gonna Misha is gonna give that that wrap gift to Hop. I know that sometimes humans are cheered up by surprises, so I grabbed this gift to see if you would be surprised by opening it and cheer your spirits a little bit. Hopper is so taken aback by this. So then he like slowly looks down at the gift that Misha thrust into his hands and like slowly rips back the wrapping paper. And what does he see? Well, I'm going to answer your question with a question. And this is something I want you to ponder for next episode. And so, Arian, my question to you is... What does Hopper Scotch's new hat look like? Like, you know, you left something there. Oh my god, I didn't even think about my hat, though. I really like the snake and the, like, elephant thing. I know, it's a little prince. It's, it's so good. Prince. It's from the little prince. It was... <laughs> my first thought when you said snake and elephant was, there's a snake in my boot. <laughs> I didn't know what to make of that. That was also my first thought. It took me, <laughs> no, even knowing what it was, it took me several seconds to be like, what? No, it does not sound like the Ricola ad. Ricola. No, no, Hallie, it's Persona. Persona. <laughs> no, La Adrian with an apostrophe. Just a little. La Adrian with an apostrophe. La Adrian. La Adrian with an apostrophe. La Adrian.